Hey, it's Tom here and welcome back to the channel. So in this video, I wanna talk through um, basically some of my highlights from a 2006 talk that Lee Lu did at Columbia University. Now, Lee Lu is kind of famous in the value investing world for basically being the only fund manager that Charlie Munger has ever invested his own money with. And throughout this talk at Columbia, Lee Lu basically shares his fairly straightforward investment checklist as well as gives a couple of example investments that he actually made using that checklist and he kind of walks through his logic with each of those two particular companies. Now like I mentioned, Lee Lu is kind of famous in the value investing world for uh, Charlie Munger being an investor in his fund and his fund has experienced phenomenal performance. The latest update I can find was in 2018 and the after fee return out of Lee Lu's fund over a 20 year period, so from 1998 through to 2018, was 15.7% per year, like I say, after fees. So the before fee performance is obviously gonna be a little bit better than that. And uh, through that same period of time, the underlying index, the S&P 500, actually only returned 6.6%. So he's got a little over 9% outperformance over about a 20 year period, which is very impressive in anyone's language. And before Lee Lu ever became a fund manager, he has a pretty incredible backstory. He was actually involved in the Tiananmen Square protests in the 1980s in China, escaped China to get to the US, uh, actually wrote a book on kind of his early life in China, which was called Moving the Mountain, My Life in China. And he actually then sold the rights to that book and it was turned into a sort of documentary movie by the same name, Moving the Mountain. So um, really kind of rough, I guess, start to life for Li Lu. He then went on to study at Columbia University and this story of his studies at Columbia is kind of insane in my book. So during his time at Columbia, he actually studied three degrees at once. Uh, he studied law, he did a BA in economics and he also got his MBA. And during his time at Columbia, he had a negative net worth as he described it, but he did have cash. He had kind of money from his student loans and uh, using value investing principles that he really got obsessed with after hearing Warren Buffett actually come and do a guest lecture at Columbia. He took that student loan money, invested it really, really well and actually ended up leaving Columbia University with about $200,000 to his name. Now, unfortunately, there aren't a lot of Lee Lu talks out there. Uh, there's only sort of two or three or four that I can kind of find, but they are all very, very good. Uh, this 2006 presentation at Columbia is by far my favorite because it gets into some of the specifics of his investment strategy. And I may just be saying this because I've recently been watching some of these talks from Lee Lu, uh, but the more I think about it, the more I believe that Lee Lu may be one of, if not the best investor on the planet today. I'm just gonna put that out there, I know. Uh, Warren and Charlie are incredible, but uh, if you want to look at some slightly younger professional money managers, kind of who's still got a long runway for growth, I think Lee Lu is very, very close to the top of my list of people to follow. So what is Lee Lu's investment checklist? Uh, it's pretty straightforward actually, there's only four points on it, and uh, the context in which he talks about this investing checklist is basically flipping through things like Moody's manuals or uh, value line information, where you basically just get a one pager of basic info about a company, and he's essentially just spending kind of a couple of minutes on each page, flicking to the next one to look at the next company, and he's trying to make a very quick decision on whether basically he should spend more time looking into that particular company. So um, the four step checklist for Lee Lu is firstly, is it cheap? So are there some surface level numbers that suggest it might be worth a closer look? Uh, is it a good business? Who's running it? And what did I miss? And later on in the talk, he goes on to say that the overarching thing he wants to be able to uh, sort of ask himself once he's at the end of going through that investment checklist, he wants to ask himself, is my analysis both accurate and complete? And is it backed by sound, complete, accurate information with a huge insight? So that's the checklist from Lee Lu. So let's get into a couple of the example investments that he talks through in this 2006 Columbia presentation. And I will leave the link to that talk down in the description below. I shared it on my community page uh, just yesterday, so you may have already seen it potentially from that, but uh, I'll share the link down in the description. And one of the things you will notice when you watch that talk is that Lee Lu is pretty ruthless with these students. He is um, very sharp mentally and running some of these numbers very, very quickly with basic information on a company and just being able to uh, you know, figure out market caps and shares outstanding and returns on invested capital and so on very, very quickly and kind of snappily, if 
that's a word. And um, he really grills some of these students at Columbia for not being able to give him numbers very quickly. And he tells a couple of people off for trying to use a calculator in that process as well. So that's quite entertaining. I was actually talking to uh, Investing with Frank, uh, actually rebranded the channel recently to Frank Tabor uh, just yesterday. And I was sort of talking through a video idea along these lines. Maybe I'll um, get a one pager myself out of an old Moody's manual or a copy of Value Line or something. And uh, maybe I'll watch that Lee Lu presentation and pretend that he's asking me the questions about, you know, give me the market cap and so on. And I'll, I'll see if I can keep up. Maybe that might be a fun video to do at some point. But uh, anyhow, let's get into the two companies. So the first one that Lee Lu talks about is Timberland. You may remember Timberland from the late 90s and early 2000s. Potentially, I've got very vague memories of like, you know, famous musicians and stuff wearing Timberland boots. <laughs> They're basically a shoe company. Uh, and it was one that came across Lee Lu's radar uh, in the late 90s or early 2000s. So the first thing that catches Lee Lu's eye is he sees a couple of basic metrics on the company. Firstly, he sees that it's trading at about five times earnings. And secondly, he sees that it's trading at about one times book value. So um, that kind of immediately get some past the first point on the checklist that it's potentially cheap it's trading at a low PE ratio and uh, we'll have to do more work on the book value but if that book value was relatively liquid and could be sold at the value actually stated on the balance sheet of the company then that potentially gives us some good downside protection as well so um, yes it's potentially cheap now and secondly we need to figure out is it a good business and this is where Lee Lu basically starts to investigate what's actually in that book value and tries to figure out things like the return on invested capital in the business. And this is not an uncommon approach. We know that people like Phil Town, like Joel Greenblatt, like Warren Buffett, like Charlie Munger, all really like to focus on returns on capital or returns on equity as really good indicators of the quality of a business. So um, this is the thought process that Lee Lu goes through with Timberland. So he finds that uh, the book value consists of mostly tangible assets. So it's not goodwill, there's not a whole lot of uh, brand value stated on the balance sheet or anything like that. Um, it's mainly real estate, cash, uh, inventory, and you know, fairly liquid assets that could be converted to cash very, very quickly. And what he specifically says he's trying to get a feel for is basically the unlevered returns on capital. So he doesn't want to know what the return on equity is. He doesn't want to see that juiced up by debt or anything. He's trying to get a feel for if this business had no leverage in it, uh, if we back out any of the assets that aren't necessarily required to run the business, uh, what's just the pure kind of return on capital within that core business of Timberland. And these are kind of the numbers for that particular situation. So they had about $300 million in book value. The market cap, again, was also about $300 million. So it was trading about one times book. Uh, he found that about $100 million of that book value was actually real estate. So with his return on capital calculations, he basically threw that out the window. Doesn't really care about the real estate investments. He just wants to focus on the core Timberland, you know, shoe business. So he found that if we exclude that 100 million, we take 300 minus 100, we're down now down to 200 million capital deployed in the actual business. And the earnings pre-tax for the company that particular year was about 100 million dollars. So 100 over 200, we have a very high quality business because it's producing about a 50% return on invested capital. So within only a couple of minutes now, we are halfway through the checklist. We've figured out that it's cheap. Uh, we figured out that it's a good business. So now we need to look at who's running it and what did I miss? So uh, in terms of who's running it, this was probably the biggest turnoff for most investors looking at Timberland. So uh, you'll see when you look at some of the ownership of the business and the management sort of incentives and so on, uh, the family owns about 40% of the shares outstanding. Now this is typically a really good thing because you're gonna have uh, you know, incentives of the family typically aligned with the minority shareholders as well. If the family's net worth is strongly linked to the stock price, that obviously gives them a lot of incentive to make the stock uh, obviously go up over time and perform well. So the family owns about 40% of it. The real issue here was that although they only own 40% of the stock, and I say only, but that is a very large amount, um, they actually had 98% of the controller of the voting rights within the business. And although that's kind of a turn off sometimes to a lot of investors, uh, this prompted Lee Lu to basically dive deeper and try to really understand who these people are and what kind of motivates those people. And he describes his role 
uh, kind of going through this as being a bit of an investigative journalist. That's how he sort of describes this particular part of the process. And um, basically he gets really into the details. So he tells the students, you know, go to their community, visit the people they know, go to their church, their synagogue, introduce yourself to their friends and their neighbors. Uh, obviously this is not going to be fully possible for every company you look into. And I'm sure Lilu has much better access to a lot of these people than you know me down here in New Zealand and that sort of stuff but um, he really wants to get uh, in deep and really understand who these people are and he found that at uh, Timberland the father as he described it seemed like a simple decent guy just a high school graduate uh, the son went to business school uh, was already COO of the company uh, even though he was only Lee Lu's age at the time which was probably in his late 20s, maybe early to mid 30s at the most, I would say. And interestingly, uh, Lee Lu actually saw that the son at Timberland, who, like I say, was the COO, was actually on the board of a separate uh, entity with one of Lee Lu's friends. Uh, so Lee Lu decided to also get on that board so that he could he could get to know the, the COO at, uh, at Timberland. And he basically liked everything he saw. He thought they were very high quality people and that got him through kind of the first three steps of his checklist. He then asked himself the final question, what did I miss? And he really felt like he hadn't missed too much. Uh, you've got a good business, you've got uh, a trading at a cheap price run by great people. And uh, he then basically went out and bought a lot of the stock. Now, before Lee Lu actually shared the kind of results of that investment, he put to the students, you know, if hypothetically you had $100, how much of your $100 portfolio would you invest in that particular investment? And, you know, he talks about how 95% of participants in the market would go out and at most maybe put on like a one or two percent position in the portfolio he kind of makes fun of people talking in basis points instead of in percentage points because if they say you know we're putting on 50 basis points or 500 basis points it makes it sound like a really large number even though it's not. And even though Lee Lu doesn't describe exactly how much of his portfolio he put into Timberland, uh, it's very clear from how he's kind of answering this question that he put a hell of a lot of his portfolio into Timberland. So, I put a shitload of <laughs> Anybody know what happens afterwards? So in terms of how that played out, basically over the next two years, the stock went up 700%. It was uh, a massive home run with Timberland. And uh, Lee Lu also described that return as uh, not kind of a very risky return, if that makes sense. So he had a business that was trading at five times earnings. Uh, the highest that multiple ever got was about 15 times earnings. So there was a lot of multiple expansion, definitely. But the underlying earnings were growing as well. So it's not like the business was flat and you just had multiple expansion only and it was started trading at like 100 times earnings or something and it was one of these big high flyer stocks that um, could really come back down to earth at, at any time quite quickly it was propelled by yes multiple expansion you know to a significant extent it, it tripled in terms of its its pe but it also grew earnings the underlying earnings at about 30 percent a year so um, absolute home run for Lee Lu, and that's the first investment story that he shared in this talk now the next example that Lee Lu gave was actually in a Korean company. Uh, I couldn't quite make out the name in this particular talk. There were a few bits where the audio cut out and I don't know if he ever actually even said the name, but uh, we do know that it's a Korean company and uh, I will also say that there wasn't as much kind of qualitative analysis in this particular stock as far as I could tell. So with the Timberland example, you know, he actually got to know some of the executives in the company. Uh, yes, it was cheap, but he was doing a lot of the sort of qualitative work on who's actually running the business. Uh, with this Korean company, I think it was a little more quantitative. So once he worked through some of the actual stats uh, for the business, we can tell that it's extremely cheap, which I'll get into in a sec. And I think that it was kind of even cheaper than the Timberland example. So he was perhaps a little less reliant on the qualitative side of this analysis. But nonetheless, let's kind of get into this example. So uh, this Korean company had a market cap of $60 million and it was trading at about two times earnings. So it was earning about $30 million a year. So if we go back to the checklist again, is it cheap is point number one. And I think um, that more than ticks that box to kind of keep looking a bit deeper if it's trading at two times earnings. So um, the second thing around kind of cheapness and that first step of the checklist for Lilu 
was actually looking at the book value of the company. So the book value was about 230 million. Like I mentioned just before, the market cap was 60 million. So it's trading, trading at a very deep discount to its book value. So just like Timberland, he then goes in and tries to understand what's actually in that book value. Is it tangible? Is it intangible? If we liquidated the company, could we actually realize that book value? Or is it kind of just a make-believe figure on a piece of paper? And this is basically what he found kind of within that book value. So he found that about $70 million of the current assets was actually cash. So um, that is certainly something that can be uh, liquidated, uh, I guess, immediately, essentially. So uh, $70 million in cash. They had $180 million in fixed assets. So uh, within that, they had 100% ownership in a hotel, which on the balance sheet was recorded at $30 million. They also had a 13% ownership in a department store uh, recorded on the books at $30 million. Uh, that department store was actually traded publicly. And when he was talking through about flicking through Value Line, this department store was just on the next page of Value Line, which is quite handy. Um, when he looked up that company, that department store, um, it actually had a market cap of $600 million. So that 13% ownership, although it was listed on the books at $30 million, was actually worth more like $80 million. So there was some kind of off balance sheet value that Lelou's just found there. Um, they also had a 15% ownership in three cable companies and as he described it, a whole bunch of real estate. And uh, the real estate again was listed at cost and uh, over the 10 years or so since that cost was kind of put on the books at this particular company, the Korean real estate market had actually gone up a lot. So again, potentially you have a little bit more kind of hidden value that's not necessarily displayed on the balance sheet. So if we add all of this stuff together, um, we're paying 60 million, that's the market cap. We have 70 million in cash, another 100 million in stock holdings from these uh, minority ownerships I just talked about. Uh, 30 million in value from a hotel that again, hadn't changed in 10 years, even though the stock market or the real estate market had gone up a lot, I should say. So where he eventually got to is uh, the book value is probably two or three times greater than it's, actually, than it's actually stated as. And even then you're paying a deep, deep discount to book with the current market cap. And you've also actually got a business that's producing a lot of cash and it's trading at two times earnings. So if you put all of that together, that definitely passes through the two filters of is it cheap and is it a good business? Now, in terms of the last two questions that Lilu asks himself around who's who's running the company and what did he miss? Uh, he again found really high inside ownership. So he saw that about 50% um, of the stock outstanding was owned by insiders. He really didn't talk a lot more about the management in this case, but he did talk quite a bit about what he missed. And, um, you know, he actually asked some of the students in this class at Columbia what, uh, what they think he might have missed. And they listed off things like, you know, 100 kilometers north of North Korea, you've got this crazy guy with nuclear weapons and so on. So there's a few kind of things to things to consider here. But um, Lee Lu felt that the risk reward was really, really stacked in his favor. So um, he ended up just like Timberland, again, betting quite big on this particular situation. Uh, turned out the department store, which this company had a holding in, uh, the stock went from 22 to about 100. So that was about 5x. And uh, the actual you know, straight up company itself uh, went from $12 a share to $70 a share. So um, about a five or six X multiple in terms of his return. So that is Lilu's investment checklist and a few of my highlights from that particular talk. Uh, like I said at the start, Lee Lu is an absolute beast. He's got a, a really interesting backstory, worked super hard through Columbia to um, not only come out with three degrees, but also a positive net worth uh, after doing some great investment with some borrowed student loan money, which is just crazy impressive. And he's also got one of the best professional investment track records I've ever seen. And, you know, he attracted Charlie Munger to his fund. So he is almost certainly one of the greatest investors alive today. And he's uh, very high up my list in terms of people to follow. So I do hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please hit like and hit subscribe if you haven't done so already. But that's it for me and I will see you in the next video. Cheers.